welcome to a new week, the second in the year 2022. In fact, the year is already getting old and it's time to settle in for business. Business Morning on Channel Television is the best way to do that. So let's have some serious and relative discussion for the next 55 minutes. I'm Ini John Mekwa. Well, we'll start this conversation with oil. Oil prices etched up for supply disruption in Kazakhstan and Libya offsets worries stemming from the rapid global rise in Omicron infections. Brent's crude gained 16 cents to $81.91 a barrel, while U.S. West Texas intermediate crude was up 15 cents to $79.05. Cents a barrel. Kazakhstan's largest oil venture is gradually increasing production to reach normal rates at the Tengiz field after protests limited output there in recent days. In Russia, evade, if Russia evades Ukraine, it could disrupt Russian crude exports to Europe and push oil prices even higher. Oil is also drawing support from rising global demand and lower than expected supply additions from the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries and its allies. OPEC's output in December rose by 70,000 barrels per day from the previous month versus a 253,000 barrels per day increase allowed under the OPEC Plus supply deal, which restored output slashed in 2020 when demand collapsed under COVID-19 lockdowns. And in Nigeria, uh, the country's capital importation has dropped by 1.68 trillion naira in one year. Data from the National Bureau of Statistics shows that between January and September 2020, total capital importation amounted to $8.55 billion. While for the same period in 2021, foreign capital inflows into the country fell by $4.08 billion. That's 1.68 trillion naira, and it was at $4.47 billion. Foreign portfolio investment contributed the largest amount to capital inflows, amounting to $4.31 billion, which is 73.63% of the total capital importation, followed by other investments, which accounted for $1.33 billion naira, and that's just about 23%. Uh, then the foreign direct investment accounted for 3.66. Uh, in terms of sectors, the banking industry led the chart by contributing almost $3 billion to the total capital importation in the first quarter of 2020. In the second quarter, the aggregate capital inflow fell by 77.8%. Now, with the finance bill of 2021 signed, uh, 10 naira excise duty is one of those uh, on carbonated ring is one of the action points there. Taxing fixed income are some ways that the federal government intends to raise revenue for the 2022 budget. But these taxes already generated a lot of conversations. We heard from the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria. We heard from the Labour Union. Well, we'll have another conversation on that after the break. That's on Business Morning on Channels Television. Welcome back. Well, for 2022 fiscal year, the projected revenue for the federal government is 10.7 trillion naira, and it looks like most of this will come from taxes. So at the budget breakdown, the Minister of Finance confirmed that the federal government's introduction of excise duty of 10 naira per litre on all non-alcoholic carbonated and sweetened beverages. There's also tax on fixed income, another on courier businesses, a whole lot of taxes coming up there. Well, we have Michael Angu, partner at Anderson Nigeria, joining us from our Abuja studio to explore some possible impacts of this development. Uh, good to speak with you, Mr. Anger. Good morning. Uh, Ini, good morning. Thank you. So, excise duty is a form of tax imposed on production, licensing, and sale of goods. Ten naira for every one liter of soft drink. What do you see as a possible, or what are some of the possible impacts that you see? Well, um, so let me first say that there is a history to um, the imposition of excise on non-alcoholic beverages in Nigeria. Um, as far back as 2016, there had been, um, you know, suggestions or recommendations that excise should be imposed on non-alcoholic beverages. Um, the reasoning at that time was that, look, there was a high sugar content in these products, and so it was kind of um, crafted as a sort of, you know, uh, sugar tax, as it were. Um, but this didn't happen as far back as 2016 when there was a major reforms of the excise regime in Nigeria. 
Um, but for now, I think we'll have to take the government as what it has said. It is simply a move to raise revenue for the federal government, uh, or for the federation, as it were, given that exercise is, of course, shared by the three tiers of government. Uh, from the government perspective, you can look at it as... Um, you know, uh, a low-hanging fruit because excise is usually very easy to collect tax. Um, it's collected at the wellhead, as it were, because you collect it right there based on what is produced from the factories, and it's very easy to monitor. Um, so you can understand why the imposition of excise on um, soft drinks and non-alcoholic beverages. If you recall, in 2017, uh, or I think 18, the federal government had increased excise on tobacco, um, and alcoholic beverages and had set out a three-year plan um, to, to reach the maximum amount that it wanted to reach. So uh, for tobacco, for example, you know, the, the excise rate is an ad valorem of 20%, and then um, two, two naira, 90 kobo per pack. Uh, for wines, you have about 300, uh, no, I think wine is about 150 naira per litre, spirits, 200 naira per litre, and beer, 35 naira per litre. So I think it was always coming. Um, they were ultimately going to get here. Um, from the industry perspective, you know, you will say that uh, it's another burden of taxation on the industry. But I think the government has made it clear it needs revenue to execute its products. Um, Nigeria faces severe uh, revenue shortages. So it is, um, as, as government, you know, it's always um, looking for those areas where it feels that it can tax. And so it has come to the, the, the um, you know, to um, non-alcoholic beverages. Um, I think what, what needs to really happen is to, to understand, you know, how do we arrived at the 10 naira per litre. Um, I know that, because I worked in the industry previously, I know that uh, when excise was going to be increased on non-alcoholic on alcoholic beverages, rather, there was um, a very detailed industry report. And that was why we arrived at those rates that were then adopted by government. So I don't know what conversation might have taken place between government and the food and beverage industry, the non-alcoholic beverage industry, to arrive at the rate of 10 naira. I think that's really the major conversation because you cannot say to government, do not tax a particular activity if government determines that that activity is a source of revenue for it. Yeah, but uh, another conversation, another side to it is that government might actually be shooting itself in the foot when you look at it because, uh, I mean, like the Labour Congress have come to say this is going to cause uh, unemployment and some of these companies may not be able to operate, thereby reducing even the taxes that could go to the government. So, I mean, how do you balance this? That, that's a very valid point. And, you know, okay... Yeah, so it's a very valid point, you know. The truth is that whenever you're going to increase or introduce a tax on consumption, you have to be sure that the net impact will not lead to, for example, a drop in production or a drop in consumption, which then affects your bottom line. Because if, for example, uh, you know, 100 bottles of soft drinks are consumed in Nigeria and then you impose an additional 10 naira per liter and consumption drops to as low as... Uh, 50 bottles, you then have shot yourself in the foot in the sense that you are projected to collect the 10 naira on 100 bottles, but here you are now only being able to collect on 50 bottles. So that's why I said that there should have been um, significant consultation and analysis, detailed scientific analysis to say, look, what is the minimum or maximum tax or excise that the industry can absorb without having a negative impact? Um, of course, if, if I'm speaking for the industry, I would say that uh, you know, there, there's the possibility that it would lead to so many unforeseen um, consequences. So, for example, I've said one of them will be the issue of drop in production. One of them there will be, of course, uh, impact on, on sales because people will then say, look, uh, this thing is becoming a bit too expensive and then we'll consume less of it. And then it then has a boomerang effect, you know, revenue drops for the companies. If revenue drops for the companies, tax will drop for government too. But like I said, at the end of the day, what is important is really the basis upon uh, which the 10 era was arrived at. Um, and there's always room, you know, to, to even look at these things after the act has been passed. Because, again, we know that our finance act is passed annually. So there's nothing that says that government cannot look um, at the rate and adjust it um, downwards if, indeed, it is proven that um, it will have a negative impact. Um, for the industry, of course, now they have to... Uh, pay it as it were because that is the law. So they also then have to look at those areas uh, where they can cut costs and ensure that um, this exercise uh, at the moment does not have a significant negative impact on their operations.
There's also the Nigerian Postal Services Bill, which requires licenses to contribute 2% of the annual turnover to the Universal Postal Service Fund. Uh, would you say the career sector is mature enough for this? I know you did say that. I mean, government is actually looking for uh, everywhere to make some money, you know, to fund the budget and other expenses in the country. My personal opinion is that um, I do not think that our career uh, sector is mature enough for this kind of, um, you know, fund. But having said that, uh, there are precedences. You know, we've had the um, fund that is uh, administered by the NCC, I think the uh, telecommunications fund. I can't remember the exact nomenclature, and it's been a very successful one. So government might be looking at the uptake um, in Korea in, uh, business in Nigeria. Recently, I think um, one of the positive, if you like, effects of COVID-19 is that the Korea in, uh, companies began to, you know, um, carry out, uh, you know, their Korea business more extensively. We know the likes of God is Good has really expanded their business and all of that. So government might be looking at that sector and saying, okay, this sector looks like it's maturing. But I know that there are a lot of issues in that sector. There are issues of logistics, there are issues of uh, funding, there are issues of personnel, technology, and all of that. So it might be a bit too soon. Um, another concern that people have also expressed is that this fund is going to be administered by the NIPOST itself or whatever successor agency succeeds the NIPOST. And the NIPOST operates both as a regulator and as an operator in that industry. So it's almost as if, you know, you are giving your money to a competitor <laughs> to expand its own business. So these are two major concerns that I think the industry has expressed. And again, like I always say, what is important is for government to sit down um, with the industry operators, they are the ones who are wearing the shoes. They know where it pinches. Um, and then, of course, have a mutual position. Because if you impose a tax that is resisted, ultimately, you know, then you have things like people refusing to pay the tax, high rates of evasion, and people will then try to do all sorts of things to avoid paying it. So it's important that government sits down and levels up with the Korea industry. But you're right. I think the Korea industry is really not at that uh, maturity stage where you would say that um, it should begin to pay some sort of fund to government. But like I said, you know, government is looking for revenue. And uh, there's also this conversation that perhaps this is just one way of discouraging uh, competition for nine posts. No, no, I don't, think, I don't think the government will deliberately set out to discourage uh, competition for NIPOS. In any case, um, all these companies, they are doing business in Nigeria, they are contributing to the GDP. So if government decides to stifle their business, it means that government is also going to be stifling economic growth. So I don't think that um, there's anything um, sinister to that extent that you want to stifle competition for NIPOS. What I just think it is is that, um, you know, the Korea companies are doing better probably than NIPOS is. And so NIPOS is thinking, how do I get um, funding to also upscale my own business? But like I said, what is important is how the industry is able to be carried along in these decisions. And of course, allowing the industry to then state its own position and state that, look, these are the challenges that we're facing. Um, it could even be, OK, instead of a 2%, why don't you do a 0 0.5? Uh, why don't you do a 1%? Or it could also be, why don't you set up an independent uh, party to administer the fund rather than giving the fund to NIPO? So there could be all sorts of conversations. But I do not think that government will deliberately set out to discourage competition. No, I, I don't think so. Well, yet another area of taxation is Twitter, Facebook, Google, Zoom. Others uh, now pay tax in Nigeria as the Senate passes finance bill. Um, we know that a lot of small businesses, you know, survive. I mean, we've had the impact of Twitter, which is even yet to be restored. Uh, they survive on the social media, apart from other things, that is. So um, how do you see this impacting? We know that, I mean, there are two sides, of course, to the conversation. But how do you see this impacting these small businesses, apart from individuals and, on, you know, the, uh, the social part of it? So just a quick correction before I answer your question. I think those headlines saying that uh, Twitter, Google, Facebook to pay tax in Nigeria as Finance Act is passed are, not, um, are misleading. We've, we've had these rules, um, we've had the significant economic presence rules in our tax law since the Finance Act 2019. So these companies have, um, since 2019, of course, been um, required to pay taxes in Nigeria. 
There was also an amendment to the uh, VAT Act that mandated uh, non-resident companies that provide services into Nigeria to charge VAT and remit same to the Federal Inland Revenue Service. Uh, what it is is that the rules have been expanded in such a way that um, either the companies will uh, charge the VAT on their invoices or on the amount that they charge the Nigerian consumers, or the Nigerian consumer will self-account for it. Um, so in terms of impact on people or users of the services. It's really about the increased amount of uh, VAT, which is about 7.5%. So if, for example, I, I put out an advert on Google or I put out an advert on Facebook and I'm supposed to pay uh, uh, $10, then of course there will be 7.5% on the $10 charge. Now Facebook is required to account for that 7.5 VAT. Um, either if it collects it, it then should pay it over to the Federal Land Revenue Service or I as the user we we'll paid um, over to the Federal Land Revenue Service. Well, you might look at it and say that, yes, it's going to increase the cost of adverts, for example, cost of hosting, um, you know, videos and all of that on these platforms. But at the end of the day, you know, um, Nigeria um, is entitled to tax economic activity within its borders. I know that there's the bigger conversation, OECD rules on, um, you know, taxation of digital economy and all of that. But Nigeria has decided that um, it wants to go it alone for now. And so this is where the rules are. And so if you are a user of any of these platforms, um, do not be surprised if you get your, your billing and then you see that there's a VAT charge on it. Uh, for the income, of course, earned by these entities, they are required to pay taxes to the Nigerian government. Um, what the Finance Act has done is now to reintroduce the, um, you know, uh, turnover tax or turnover rule as we were, where the tax laws allows the Federal Inland Revenue Service to charge a fair and reasonable percentage of the turnover of a non-resident company doing uh, business in Nigeria, where, for example, you're unable to determine the actual turnover of such a company or where the company has declared a turnover and you do not think that that is the actual turnover. So the Federal Inland Revenue Service has the powers, especially now specifically for these digital, uh, for these companies that provide um, electronic services, remote services into Nigeria. So the Federal Inland Revenue Service now has the right uh, to assess them to tax on a fair and reasonable percentage of their turnover. Um, just to also clarify, I, because I read in the papers that, you know, they will pay 6% of their turnover. So what is, uh, what, that calculation is really a function of um, the, the rules that have always existed, whereby the Federal Inland Revenue Service determines that 20% uh, of the turnover of a non-resident company is its profit, and then applies the 30% um, CIT rate on such profits, which then comes to 6% of turnover. So just to clarify that, you know, it's not a new tax as it were, it's just a clarification of um, the taxing rules. Because one of the concerns that um, the industry has had is that uh, the rule, profit allocation rules were not clear. So I think this brings some clarity. Now you know that if you are providing digital services into Nigeria, if you are providing remote services into Nigeria, you are likely to pay 6% of your turnover as companies in tax. Of course, in addition to charging the value-added tax for any service that you provide to a company or resident uh, individual in Nigeria. Yeah, and, and you, you touched on one of the, you know, issues going round uh, when you said fair and reasonable percentage of the turnover because uh, some people are asking, so how do you quantify, you know, what a company is supposed to pay? And you, like you said, if there are doubt as to their turnover. And all. So, I mean, that area, is it really cleared yet? How do you actually say this is the amount that uh, a company is supposed to pay? Okay, so, you know, like I said, um, there's a... Uh, a bigger conversation going on um, at, at the OECD level where, of course, the global minimum tax rules were introduced last year to say that um, companies will pay 15% um, minimum tax, you know. But uh, Nigeria has determined that it wants to tax um, the income or profits of these companies locally here. Again, the OECD rules have a threshold that is significantly high, and so uh, we didn't feel that that threshold was fair to us. So our own threshold in Nigeria is 25 million Naira. If you earn anything above uh, 25 million Naira, you should pay companies income tax in Nigeria. Now, of course, to the issue of how do you determine a fair and reasonable percentage, well, that is it. It's, it's determined by, you know, you know, you saying that, okay, I think that this is a fair and reasonable percentage. And like I told you, we've had these rules in our, in our tax laws uh, for years. Section 30 of the CIT, uh, uh, Companies Income Tax Act, has always had 
these rules that allows the Federal Land Revenue Service to tax on a fair and reasonable percentage. And I said to you that what has happened over time is that 20% of the turnover is deemed to be the profit. And that's when you have the terminology deemed profit. So if you deem that 20% is the profit and you apply 30% to it, that gives you a 6%. Of course, ultimately, I think what, will, what should happen is that we should get these companies to start to file their actual returns in Nigeria. A bit right. difficult, but not uh, impossible. And okay. so what will then happen is that we must have a mechanism to determine how much revenue they earn in Nigeria. Of course, things like their expenses and all of that will be backed out. And then we'll know their actual profits, and then we can tax those profits um, at 30%. But right. these new rules are, are, are for convenience, both for the, tax offices, uh, for the tax officials and for the companies. But ultimately, I think where the government would want to go is to have these companies probably incorporate local entities and have these local entities yeah, you know, file their yeah. actual tax returns in Nigeria mm -hmm. on that's the basis of actual of profits. And anyway, thank you so much. We need to thank you so much, Mr. Michael Angu, partner at Anderson Nigeria, for sharing your thoughts with us on the tax component of the federal government's uh, revenue drive in the country. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much, Ine. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, recently, the Shippers Association said that 82% of Nigeria's exported agro-allied products are either seized or rejected in Europe. This stands as one of the challenges to boost exports and increasing trade numbers. Why do we have issues such as this? We have the president, African Cashew Alliance, Mr. Tola Fasheru, joining us for that conversation. Good morning, Mr. Fasheru. Good to have you. Thank you so much, Sini. So much. you, uh, I mean, you're specifically into cashew. Uh, we know that so on the continent. Let's start with your experience exporting cashew or dealing with the export business in the non-oil sector of Nigeria. Share with us your general experience. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, I've been in the uh, sector. I've been a participant for the past uh, two decades, over two decades. And... Um, it's been a beautiful experience. <laughs> uh, of course, in Nigeria, as you are aware, export can be quite challenging, and that's where you have few people on that side of the, of the continuum. You, you have more of the people importing. Uh, but over time, I think export has um, grown and expanded. And then, of course, uh, you know, the commitment of people in that sector has increased. I mean, the government... The, the finance sector, you know, uh, so it's, it's been, it's been, um, it's not, we are not where we used to be. So clearly, um, a lot of improvements have, have, have occurred. Uh, government also has realized the uh, strategic importance of um, diversifying the economy away from oil. And so, uh, I mean, everybody is seeing uh, non-oil non export as, as, as a thing, and of course, a Greek uh, agro uh, uh, export is, is, a, is a thing that, of course, we see as being very, very sustainable, apart from the mineral, mineral uh, resources. So basically, it's, it's been on an upward um, trajectory. I would not completely agree that, uh, you know, because I believe we have, we have improved. So you don't think it's yeah. up to 82%? You know, I, 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 I doubt it. Okay. I, I doubt it. But... Of course, there are issues, and there are many issues, and there are reasons where there will be issues. So what percents would you put it if you say 82 uh, is not agreeable? Uh, well, it's, 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 it's difficult to put a figure. Is, uh, it, is it up to 50%? Is it below? Is it above 50%? Well, maybe, maybe, maybe 40%. Because a lot of... So for, you think like 40% of, of our products may, exported maybe, are maybe seized? 40, maybe 40%, but definitely I don't think from... I mean, it's a personal opinion. Because, of course, you have a lot of um, the agencies that are working the day and night. I mean, uh, NAVDAC is there. I mean, uh, the quarantine service is there. The federal produce is there. The uh, Nigerian Export Promotion Council, they are working. But even All the, the, even, people, even so, the number mean, of the, agencies is another, yeah. is another complaint from exporters like you, that you have too many agencies, you pay too many taxes and levies, you have a lot of time wasted because of the bureaucracy, you know, to go through. I agree with you. Uh, definitely, there are issues. Uh, of course, the issues of the port, you know what we've gone through in the past uh, three three, four years, it's been, it's been terrible. Uh, so that 
in itself. I mean, the delays and all of that will have affected the, 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 the status or the state of the, of the commodities that we, we're talking about. So a, 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 a number of them are, you know, they are, uh, can be attributable to the people who are doing it, I mean, the, the exporters themselves, who wants to go through, who wants to go through the short court measures. As you know, Nigerians, quite a lot of Nigerians like to go through short courts. Um, and so you find us being rated poorly compared to even other African countries. I mean, even if you compare some of the items that we export compared to even Benin that is close by. Because an average Nigeria is, wants to get, get rich very, very quickly. So these are issues. They're not taking their time to follow due process, you know, process in terms of even the, the planting itself, you know, and of, of course the post-harvest um, processes, uh, you know, um, the, 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 the drying, the packaging, the labeling, you know, so many things that we need to change our orientation in Nigeria. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a all-encompassing thing. It's not just export. It's a Nigerian thing, which I believe, um, you know, some kind of reorientation will help us to to to, to address. Yeah. So, yes. Mm. That 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 brings to mind. Uh, I I spoke to uh, someone who is into popcorn. Who, who, who sells popcorn. Mm. And uh, she told me that she had to ex import the corn that she uses. And I still find that worrying because, I mean, what is wrong with our corn here? She mm. said our corn uh, don't, doesn't have the right quality. And like you noted, the, the, following the process, mm. the pre-planting, the post-harvest, you know, and, and I, I think that sometimes we cause our problems for ourselves. Ideally, I, I think so. And, you know, some of these things can be managed by having a strong private sector governance in each of these commodities. Every commodity you have in Nigeria could be a game changer for the economy, you know. I mean, if you look at a, com a country like um, Vietnam, for instance, cash is a game changer for them. I mean, do, they do about $3 billion yearly. So what do they do? Whatever they have, they put in their best in terms of the production, in terms of the yield, vis-a-vis -vis even the land area that they have. A lot of these countries don't even have as much land area that we have, and they're able to get better um, yield from it. So right from the yield, and then, of course, the, the post-harvest handling, and then adding value, which changes the story entirely. Okay, so if Nigeria is, for instance, uh, uh, earning like um, $450 million, they are earning over $3 billion. Why? Okay, they are producing 300,000 tons, we are producing uh, 270,000 tons. But you can see the, the wide gap in the, in the revenue, you know. So, but I, I, I think um, it's, it's like every commodity, you know, and I think government is already doing that, but maybe it's, it's slow a bit because, you know, you see government now Well, is it up. government or the private sector? I mean, we can't just put everything on the government. If the be. government provides infrastructure, yeah. if the government provides um, security, for instance, I mean, we should have people like you go into these businesses and make some money by providing, uh, in, by boosting the economic uh, uh, GDP and all that. Definitely. Like I said, we are not where we, where we used to be. We are not where we used to be. Nigeria was producing maybe a hundred thousand, about a hundred thousand, a hundred thousand tons in 2011. We are doing 270 thousand tons now. So there's been some 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 uh, improvement. Okay, you know what we were earning like 50 million dollars. You know, about that time, now we're earning about 450 million. But what brought about the improvement? Is it that there's been development of the value chain, or is it just more people are going into the production, we have more farmers, or there's been, you know, better infrastructure? Okay, let me say, for the cashew experience, basically, I, I was fortunate to be the president of the Natural Cashew Association of Nigeria between 2011 and 2020, before I became the president of the African Cashew Alliance. And, you know, when I came in, I looked at the sector. The, it's, the sector was really in, in a big, big, big mess. We were not able to, 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 to sell all that we were producing. The, the farmers were crying, you know, and they were not paying attention to, because they were not earning as much as they should have. So they were not paying attention to the, the best practices in terms of the production 
and in fact, in fact, also in terms of the post harvest handling. So, what did we do? We, 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 you know, we looked at it. We told them these are the the things that you need to do. These are the best practice that you need to do. International best practices to change the narrative. Okay. We, we, have, we develop a strong association, a strong and viral association with people buying into it. You know, and that's very important because people have to buy into it for a change to occur, for a transform, uh, transformation to occur. And then, of course, there's a network in the global market. You cannot be isolated. You stay in Nigeria and say you are marketing a, a particular product. You must network globally to see that you know, your market have access. Your, there's an understanding that the other people have about your product, okay? So those are the things. Going over there, meeting our buyers, the major countries that we're selling to, having an understanding with them. In fact, we signed the MOU. I remember in 2013, we signed the MOU that we're going to sell so much, about 80,000, about a particular country out of the 100,000 we're producing, we're going to sell 80,000 to you. And they said, okay, and then we're going to improve. There has been a bad story. Okay, we're going to improve. We're going to get back to our farmers, tell them what to do. Our marketers, our exporters, tell them what to do. And then they called their bankers also to support them. And so before you knew it, when we got back, you were not drying your cashews well. You, you know, just leave it to dry by itself. No, it's not done. The quality will reduce. So we told them, you need to put it, spread it well and in good time. We were using polypropylene bags. You know, that will not work. You will keep crying if you don't change it. You've got to use jute bags and see what the jute bags, you know, as it is. So that changed. The quality also improved. Then more acceptability. Today, the, the thing, the, it's changed. We sell all that we produce. The farmers are happy. The farmers are able to produce more. And that's why you can see the figure move. And there are a lot of people even going to plantations. But one thing also we did was to bring government on board. OK? So we brought government on board. I remember Dr. Akumi Adishino at that time. We had a series of meetings. You know, the president, uh, uh, who was the minister of agriculture at that time, was presently president of Africa yeah, Development yeah. Bank. We sat with him. This is it. He was surprised at some point. That, ah, cashew is a snack. But I said, this is what is happening in other countries. This is a country that's handing over $3 billion. We can, we can make it happen, you know. And then we, we, we began to work on it. We got, we, we, you know, the government understanding was there. So um, what I'm saying is everything, it's... That you, you cannot work in silos. Everybody, all the stakeholders, the international community, you know, and all of that. Of course, infrastructure. You know, infrastructure. I mean, definitely, Nigeria Export Promotion Council, also, we brought them in. You know, I remember, I mean, Mr. Shagma Wolo, when he came in, you know, we, we, we opened it to him and said, wow. And he also gave... It's so it sounds to, to me like you're challenging, I mean, you are in Cashew, yes. you're challenging maybe somebody to spearhead same movements Definitely. in cocoa, Definitely. in cassava, in yam. Definitely. I know we had issues like this with yam, with yam. the other time we yeah. tried to export yeah. yam. Definitely. That's what we are saying. The narrative can be changed for all the commodities. For cashews now, what we are working now is to increase value addition. And I'm doing that, I'm on the African platform now. You know, discussing. Fortunately, you know, lately we had these uh, uh, in, uh, Cashew um, um, uh, International Consultative Council. So we're working at the level of Africa now and bringing the governments, mm. various governments in Africa, to see the need for Africa to step up the game and then ensure that what they are producing, yeah. you know, uh, locally, we are not just sending it raw, we are adding value, making things uh, better, and then, of, of course, Increasing the, our own appetite here exactly. so that we can eat what we are producing. Exactly. So those are the and, I, and I think we need to. But do it doesn't this. just happen. It, 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 it doesn't take a lot happen. of individual intentionally doing it. Intent proactive. I, I, I really wish that someone is doing this for tomatoes because I'm when you go to the north, I remember I was going from one state to the other, from Bochi to Kaduna or something like that. And then on the road, you can a see tomatoes and pepper, you know, just out there, you know, because there's no preservation, there's no processing of it and all that. Yeah. We have a lot to do in Definitely. Nigeria, and I know we'll get there. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Tola Fashiri, President, African Cash Alliance, Thank for you. joining us this Thank morning and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.
What's on our attention to the markets now uh, with Will Ebong. Hello, Will. Hope Good you morning. had a lovely weekend. Uh, yes, I did. Good morning. I hope you had one too, Will. But I, I know that. I <laughs> but I don't think the forex markets had a very good weekend because, I mean, trading last week compared to what we're expecting, we saw that the um, activities there at the FMDQ exchange closed negative last week as the total turnover was at 511.46 uh, um, million dollars there that's a 19.42 percent drop you know from what we had the last time and that's as, a, as a january the 7th that's friday the closing this is not quite this is not surprising as nigeria's fx reserves we're seeing it declining you know week on week and it sustains its downtrend it's declined by 1.78 million dollars as 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 of January the fifth to forty point five two billion dollars. Now a further analysis of the trading results showed that the FX derivatives there was down twenty four point five three percent to one hundred and sixty two point eight one million dollars. While total value at the I and E window, that's the FX spot market, was at three hundred forty eight point six four million dollars. That's sixteen point seven nine percent drop. Great. We move to the. The, the FX market, we saw that the FX drop. The Naira, that's quite significant there. I just want to stay on that a little bit. We saw that there was a 0.36% drop there. Now, they currently received 419 4 Naira, uh, 16 cover to a dollar against uh, 417 uh, point, uh, 419 Naira, 65 cover, which we had in the previous week. Now, we're seeing the Naira falling further and further down, and this is really affecting things in the market. Now, we move quickly to the fixed income market where it was quiet, you know, most of last week with minimal volumes traded across the board. We saw at the close of trading last week, and then overall average was down. It was around 11.91%. Treasury bills market was also very, 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 very low. But it closed bearish while the bonds market closed mixed. But we have Ladi Bello, fixed income dealer at Access Bank to tell us more about what happened last week and probably a better outlook for this week. Good morning, Ladi. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me. Oh, great. Now, last week, we saw a lot of buy interest uh, across the, the curve and the secondary market. Even after the budget presentation, you know, the breakdown by the Ministry of Finance, well, what actually that what? What <laughs> we saw a mix, but at the end of um, the trading for Friday, we saw a mixed trade close for the bonds and the bearish one for the treasury bills. What are we missing here, especially with the uptick we saw after the budget presentation? Okay, well, we saw uh, a lot of activity last week um, uh, with regard to the budget that was released. Uh, and as well, uh, what was significant to note was the increased or excess liquidity uh, in the system uh, as of last week. So we saw the build market across the NCB and Omoka's rally, uh, but we saw most of the interest largely skewed towards the special bills, uh, which was offered at relatively higher yields uh, when compared with the other maturities in the market. Uh, yesterday, uh, last week as well, we had an almost maturity of about seven billion uh, credited into the system. Uh, this also further intensified the bullish sentiment uh, that we witnessed as well. Uh, we saw quite a bit of bids uh, across the uh, across board, uh, but with minimal offers to match, which also heightened the level of uh, which also heightened the level of uh, activity uh, in the market as well. Um, this were observed mostly um, on the February, the short attendance of the OMO curve, uh, while we saw most of the interest skewed towards the short uh, and medium tenor securities across the NTB. We saw an OMO auction being conducted as well, uh, although the subscription stood at about 165 billion, 3 billion, so no more than 50 billion, uh, which was what was on offer. And stock rates were maintained at 7, 8.5, and, and 10.1, respectively, across the short medium and long-term maturities that were offered. When switching on to the bond space, uh, we saw a similar trend as well. We saw the level of liquidity in the system uh, affect the direction of the market. So we saw a bit of a buying uh, trend, which uh, resulted in a, a slight decline in yields by about 10 basis points across mm -hmm. the bond curve. Um, mm -hmm. We saw the demand intensify towards okay. the belly of the curve. That's the 2036 mm -hmm. and 2037 bonds, which traded uh, hovered around the 129 uh, percent mark. But closing the week, uh, we saw bids uh, take a bit of a back step. Uh, although we saw firm bids across the curve, this was at uh, fairly elevated levels. Uh, going into this week, uh, because of the increased activity that we saw last week, we, we think that the buying interest was uh, a little bit played out. Uh, the DMO is expected to conduct uh, its usual bi-weekly NTB auction, offering a total of about $77 billion across the three maturities, standard maturities that are offered. 
And we also expect the CBM to float another AMOG auction on Thursday, uh, which it has done in recent times to manage uh, the system liquidity. Uh, it's mm-hmm. a bit of a blurry picture in terms mm-hmm. of the direction in the bond space, simply because mm-hmm. of the um, NTB, sorry, the bond issuance calendar not being released for the first mm-hmm. quarter, which mm-hmm. should dictate the pace of the market in the near term. So what should investors be looking at? Are you saying that we should expect less apathy? I mean, apathy from investors because of the, the lack of uh, the bond uh, calendar not being issued on time? Or do you think that investors are just going to go all out and just go on risk on and take on, you know, bonds and then not uh, worry about the direction of the market? Okay, well, the direction of the market is quite key uh, so as you don't take the wrong positions. Um, but by and large, the uh, release of the Q1 calendar uh, would allow the market, you know, pick up a little bit for the year. Um, without this being issued, nobody really knows the clear-cut direction. So market participants, by and large, would trade cautiously this week, uh, cherry-pick on the instruments that are clearly uh, mispriced uh, and have a relatively high um, uh, yielding, uh, ha- have a relatively high yield when compared to uh, some of its comparables across the curve. Uh, but we will see some activity this week, especially on the T bills market, as uh, local investors continue to demand uh, for such papers, shorter yeah. tenant instruments, uh, as we expect yields uh, through the course of the year to inch up, uh, as we all know this is the pre election year. Okay. Thank you so much, Ladi, for the insight, and we look forward to that uh, positive um, outlook. Uh, so, Ine, is over to you. That's what we have. Thank you so much, Will. And uh, so now we'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll do an opening call to London. Do stay with us. Over the weekend, there was news that the UK had about 150,000 deaths from COVID-19 in the face of no lockdown yet. Effort by businesses to curb the spread is what we'll be looking at and a whole lot more. Well, let's get an update from Juliana. Hello, Juliana. Good morning. Good morning, Eni. So, Senior Minister Michael Gov is saying that the country is not yet in a position to say it can live with COVID-19. I thought we were already living with COVID-19, but what prompted this uh, statement? Yeah, well, quite rightly, you said over the weekend, uh, Britain reached a grim milestone of 150,000 deaths of COVID-19, one of the highest death rates um, in the world, certainly one of the highest death rates in Europe, something that's likely uh, to have put a shiver down the back of uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson. And as that's happening, of course, uh, we're currently um, having to live with Omicron, uh, which even though we know isn't as deadly as previous strains, it's still highly um, permissible um, and is putting a lot of strain um, under the NHS and other institutions because currently uh, we have an isolation period of seven days. So even if you're not um, uh, too poorly and you don't have to go into hospital, if you do have it, you do have to isolate. So there's lots of discussions at the moment um, because it isn't as deadly as to whether uh, the self-isolation period should be reduced from seven to five days. Also, uh, for the fifth day in the row, um, the number of people that are testing positive uh, with Omicron has fallen. I believe yesterday there were about 141,000 positive cases. So lots of Um, conversations are ongoing at the moment um, as to whether uh, for now Britain should uh, try to live with Covid rather than try to um, avoid the spread of Covid. That was uh, the discussion that prompted uh, uh, Michael Gove, a senior cabinet minister, to say that we're not yet ready to do that. But lots of um, uh, uh, talking points coming out of Downing Street suggest that Prime Minister Boris Johnson alongside Sajid Javid, the health secretary, are working towards this living with COVID strategy, which will be reduced and which will be produced in March. We're already kind of getting there with the fact that um, uh, now uh, travel restriction tests have been lifted. um, Schools haven't been closed. I think lots of observers thought that after Christmas, things would get worse and we would be heading into some sort of lockdown. But we do seem to be uh, going the other way, even with that, uh, you know, tremendously high death rate. And even though we know that Omicron is still uh, very transmissible. Yeah, well, it's good to know that uh, at least uh, the new cases are dwindling and we do hope it continues. Well, there's also the issue of Brexit. Uh, Brexit challenges are still in the news now. UK firms are paying 10% more than EU rivals when it comes to emissions. How come? 
Well, yeah, this is a pretty complicated um, story, uh, but just another fallout from Brexit, um, which is leaving beleaguered businesses uh, more embattled. Of course, we've currently got an energy price crisis in the country, uh, which is crippling uh, some businesses. And now uh, what's uh, emerged from the talks that the business secretary, Kwasi Kwarteng, is having with uh, business energy leaders is the fact that uh, companies in Britain are paying as you said, 10% more uh, for emissions uh, than their EU counterparts. I believe in the EU they're paying 75 euros a tonne. In Britain they're paying 85 euros. And that's because um, since uh, we left uh, the single market, we also left the EU carbon uh, market, which is significantly larger than, of course, the one that Britain has, because it's new. It was only set up um, about a year ago. The one in Europe has uh, been in, in existence since since 2005, so they've got a lot more liquidity. And really what this carbon market does is it acts as an incentive for cleaner businesses. So if you are a clean business, you can offload uh, some of your carbon permits to cheaper uh, firms. So British firms just don't have the ability to do that now. And again, it's all come out in the wash uh, because at the moment, businesses as well as the government are trying to crack their heads together to try and uh, see how they're going to alleviate some of the, the, the financial woes that are coming to Britain um, in April. And again, uh, Brexit has reared um, its ugly head, but no uh, formal uh, statement from the government as to how they're going to approach this situation. All right, Juliana, trust you to stay on the story. And of course, we'll keep tabs with you. Thank you so much. And I'll talk to you at 1.30. Thanks, Amy. Let's move to the crypto market now. A uh, very red Friday. I don't know about the weekend, but <laughs> Ladi knows. Oh, yes, it was quite a turbulent uh, week uh, last week for the crypto market. But we still see uh, Bitcoin still staying above the 40,000 level. Ladi so, is so hopeful. It, I mean, still see. Still, there, there's, Bitcoin, there's, <laughs> Bitcoin, Bitcoin is you know, <laughs> Some see sell and run. Some see buying opportunity. So it, mm. it all depends on your perspective okay. with this market. Uh, but right now, it's extreme fear. Uh, yesterday was extreme fear, last week fear. It actually got to 10 points at some point. Uh, talking about the greed fear index shows you uh, sentiment in the market. And right now, it's extreme fear. Uh, market cap, $1.97 trillion, below the $2 trillion mark. It's uh, trying to get back up there, uh, up 0.56%. Uh, volume still trending downward there, $71 billion in the total crypto market. Bitcoin dominance, 40.25. It did touch the 39% uh, percent, uh, level last week. And uh, we see Bitcoin below the 42,000 level there. It's down, it's up 0.19%. Uh, volume, not as much as uh, we see at this time at uh, $20.99 billion. Uh, let's bring in Olumide Additional now, a financial market analyst. Hello, Olumide. Yeah, hello, Laji. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, Olumide. This market is still struggling uh, for direction. Uh, well, in extreme fear, we did get to uh, 10 points. Uh, what should traders be doing right now? What's your outlook for the week? I think my outlook is um, bearish. Uh, if you look at what happened um, in the past uh, days, you could see that um, strong U.S. economic data and rising bond yields are weighing on risky assets, not just uh, crypto assets. You look at goods, uh, tech stocks like um, Apple, Amazon, Google, they are also tanking. So the narrative is just because we are seeing that the um, U.S. Uh, uh, economy is um, recovering very strong, and that would really force the U.S. Fed to definitely increase interest rates. And already the market is pricing 750 basis point interest rate hike, and definitely that will win on the crypto market. So my outlook is for Bitcoin is that... Uh, if Bitcoin brings it below thirty, uh, below forty uh, thousand uh, dollar support level, then we should be looking at thirty to thirty-five. And if that happens, we should see uh, record sellers in the altcoins, uh, because particularly uh, the fact that uh, liquidity is already drying up in the crypto market. And uh, looking at uh, the crypto market capitalization breaking below two trillion dollar is uh, a source of concern. And also, uh, inflation data is coming out on Wednesday. Anything that shows the U.S. inflation is high, trust me, uh, Ladi, uh, the crypto market will suffer definitely very well this week. Right. And, you know, what, what do you think is the risk-reward from here? You know, it's extreme fear. We know how the greed fear index swings. It gets to extreme yeah. greed and finds its way 
back to extreme fear? Yeah, I, I think the risk reward here yeah, is not rewarding because uh, if, you, if, you, if you understand market uh, uh, emotion sentiment, you understand that why volume is thin is that yeah, the key drivers, as wheels, are on the sidelines and any sell off, any trigger will definitely weigh on the crypto market. So I think for investors, they need to be cautious. They don't need to get too exposed in the market we are in right now. All right, Olimide, don't get too exposed. Thank you so much, Olimide. Thanks, Mario. All right, let's look at the top auto market cap. It's uh, slightly green there. We see BNB, $442. It's uh, up by 1.70%. Cardano, $1.17. It's down about 0.86%. And we see Solana there uh, just up about... 0.60% XRP below the 80, uh, 80 cent uh, mark there. And uh, top uh, five gainers, we, it's quite lean. Normally, you see this counter up double digits, but we see uh, Rose there. It's uh, up 7.65%. Zcash, $145 up 7%. And we see uh, ICP, ICP on the top gainers again. I see ICP has uh, started some kind of uptrend internet computer that's been on the downtrend for a while. Maybe it's uh, ready for some gains. And AVAX there, $89.87. Uh, top five losers, we see the top uh, nurses there, down 10.17%. Harmony, Harmony was on the rise uh, recently, but it's uh, down this morning, down 8%. And we see Bar there, uh, down about 3.14%. So uh, and it's, it's an extremely uh, afraid market right now, <laughs> if I use that term. <laughs> <laughs> You're not permitted to say that. It's extremely afraid. Extremely afraid. But well, anyway, it's a new week. It's yeah. a new week. I mean, I, I think investors are coming back up. The festivities are over and all the spending. It's now time to make money for another festive period. Yeah. So don't worry. We'll be coming back up soon. Let's see if we can make some gains. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, laddie. Well, that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for being a part of it. It's just the first one for the week. We'll have another one tomorrow. I'm Ini John Mekwa.